I would first like to introduce uh, Jim Venitas for our keynote opener this morning. Uh, Jim is an educator, advisor, technologist, and consultant with a passion for equitable and inspiring STEM education and teacher professional learning. His consultancy focuses on innovations made possible through education and industry partnerships, and he serves as an advisor to numerous education organizations, including the California Science Project, and also to here, here to us at Benetech. Um, since 2003, Jim has been teaching science teachers at Montana State University, and his background includes a BS in engineering and a master's in education, and has more than a decade of leadership experience in corporate th philanthropy and social innovation at HP, where he was really in instrumental in activating and supporting education projects. So today, Jim will be sharing about the importance of project-based learning for our students. And just a reminder to put any questions for Jim in the Q&A box, and we'll be able to get to a couple of those at the end. So I don't want to take any more time from our keynote. So without further ado, Jim, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Amanda. It's nice to be here. And thanks, everyone, for for being here as well. I know the work you do is so important and so I'm, I'm honored to share a little bit from my experience. And um, I thought I'd start with um, what kind of got me going in the whole education realm. See, my career started with engineering and uh, my first job out of college, I went to HP. And I remember the first two weeks distinctly because in week one, I came home and told my wife, Wow, I can't believe I, I get paid for having fun, you know. And in week two, I came back and said, wow, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. This is not at all like the problem sets we used to get in, in high school and college. In fact, not only is there not one right answer, I'm not always sure what the question is. So thus began my engineering career. And it also prompted me to want to be involved in education outreach because I just thought this just isn't right to graduate from an engineering program and still be unclear on what it really is. So I we started uh, working. I got my friends and engineers together, and we would do a lot of engineering outreach, um, trying to explain what engineers do. First thing I learned though is you can't just tell people what engineers do. Um, you know, we would tear apart a printer and say, "Isn't this cool?" And they would, you know, we get back blank stares. So. Uh, we started doing this 10-minute uh, engineering exercise thing where we'd, we'd take a paper bag, uh, fill it full of stuff, break them into teams, give them each a bag, each team a bag, and say, okay, you have 10 minutes to build a, uh, I don't know, a tower that would hold the tennis ball as high as possible uh, using the stuff inside the bag. Ready, set, go. You know, and they'd open it up and inside would be spaghetti and paper and tape and stuff like that. So that's that was my first introduction to the the power of uh, active learning, and it um, and it went from there. Um, in fact, what I discovered is there's really three important things that happen when you get students involved in projects, and um, I'll share some of that here. Let me share my screen and uh, give you a sense of what it is that I think are the three reasons why project-based learning is so essential, and. The first one is it can level the playing field. The second one is it's interdisciplinary, and I'll explain why that's important. And the third is that it really can be transformational. So this all began with uh, leveling the playing field. This is where I learned this was actually in the seventh grade classroom. We had got HP to buy us a, a whole pile of uh, Lego Dactic kits. And these are the ones with the gears and the pulleys and stuff. And we could go into these classrooms and uh, uh, give students a design assignment. And so in about 90 minutes, they'd, they'd be given a design assignment like a, build a, a hoist that can lift your shoe off the ground using these parts. And then they'd get off and be you know, designing all sorts of things. What was interesting to me and what I still remember from this experience, we were doing this in a seventh grade um, class, as a seventh grade science classroom. And the students were all busy, you know, wonderful, uh, you know, organized chaos going on in the classroom. And the teacher came up to me and said, you know, this is really interesting. And I said, well, what, what's, what's, what are you seeing? She goes, you can't tell who my special ed kids are. 
and you couldn't. They, every, everyone was engaged and everyone was doing something and everyone had success. It was the first time I realized that the, this kind of project really can uh, level the playing field. Um, and the uh, other activity I did, this, this is, um, this is a, uh, a more advanced version of <laughs> building something in 10 minutes where we, we did a packaging engineering design challenge. Now, the, what brought this on was I was talking to a second grade teacher here nearby and we were talking about, um, you know, why is there so little science taught in, in elementary schools? And we were talking about how the emphasis is on language arts and math and that's fine. But I said, well, we could combine all of these. And so um, we, we went ahead and um, designed a package engineering design challenge for second graders. Basically, it was an egg drop, right? And they had to create um, their own design. We gave them some materials. They brought in some of their own materials. The only requirement it was the inside materials had to be uh, sustainable, as in compostable. And so they went about, it was a three-day activity, um, and they first focus was uh, ideation and then they did a lot of planning and then they did building and they did writing and they did some math and things and it was great fun. The, the thing that was interesting to me in this case was, you know, I, I had a ladder and a 14 foot measuring stick and I thought, no, you know, no way they're going to get to 14 feet, but at least we'll have it in case we want to try something that high. They all made it to 14 feet, if not even higher. Um, so that, that was great. But but the interesting thing is it was interdisciplinary. And so this is the second point with project-based learning is, you know, there was a lot of math going on in here and a lot of writing. So we talked about um, how to chart the progress of these teams. If you look at the puppies on the left there, their first attempt was only well, made it to three feet and their second attempt made it to nine feet, but their third attempt made, went, uh, you know, up to 14 feet. So, you know, we could we could do charting, we could discuss math and, and whatnot. And so, and and they had the science notebooks. So the language arts bit was in here too. They did a lot of writing about what they were doing um, and what they were learning too. And so uh, this brings me to the third point about project-based learning. It's not only leveling the playing field, it's not only, uh, interdisciplinary and it's also can be transformational and I uh, hearken back to some work from uh, Brad McLean he just published this book about designing transformational experiences and um, I first met Brad years ago when he was uh, looking at um, they were studying out of University of Colorado Boulder the the science identity of girls and where does that come from and they decided that well, they decided, they found from their research that, that what really transforms uh, a student's point of view about themselves is these uh, special kinds of experiences. And they went so far as to develop a, a rubric that describes what a, what a transformational experience really is. You know, and, and it has these seven characteristics, my favorite of which is risk. Um, if you can imagine a student has a, a either physical, emotional, or uh, intellectual risk. You're literally and figuratively hanging by your thumbs in this experience. You're gonna remember this for, for your lifetime and it may actually change your point of view about who you are and what you can be. And there's other kinds of things in this uh, uh, Elvis uh, uh, rubric too, like a control, you know, who has the agency in this and who's really driving the experience and uh, whatnot. So if you look at, um, for example, the packaging engineering activity. It, it ticked a lot of good boxes, a lot of uh, high, high on the rubric boxes there on Elvis. Um, and I was really tickled to get an, uh, an email from a parent that reported that her daughter has changed her mind after this and wants to grow up and be a scientist to do, <laughs> to do things like this. I mean, this really, this really um, hit the mark for her and a lot of other kids do. Everyone was engaged, it was, it was great fun. The other thing about um, agency, student giving students control over things is giving them control over what it is they're designing. So this particular activity was, was a predefined problem. Uh, so 
uh, if you start on the left side of this uh, framework, now, this, by the way, was a framework we created for the California Science Project so we could uh, help uh, high school teachers introduce engineering design into their science um, disciplines. We we wanted to introduce them to these different stages. So the first stage is simply taking things apart and understanding how, how they're designed. Um, and the more you move to the right, the more you get students involved in problem solving. But by the time you get to the far end, it's really about helping your students become problem finders. And uh, the, what, the uh, drop an egg activity was really a, uh, the second column, predefined problem, you know, design a solar oven or drop an egg or whatever that. But if you give students more open-ended challenges, it becomes more their own. So like a predefined challenge, like there's too much plastic in the grocery store. What are you going to do about it? Go to the grocery store and figure out, you know, what we can do. Um, or you can go all the way to the far right, which is completely open-ended. And you can invite your students to go find a problem they want to work on. And, and then use the uh, science and math and everything else they're learning to help think about solutions. And that's when students are more than just problem solvers or problem finders. Another, another project I, I wanted to give you an example of was this thing we did with um, uh, citizen schools. And they, we, what it was is an after school program for middle school students. And it ticked a lot of boxes too. And the one that really struck me was the risk box. The, now, because the students here that we were working with were um, in East Palo Alto, which is a low income uh, region of the Bay Area. Um, students were predominantly Hispanic. Many of them um, were you know, speaking, Span well, speaking Spanish, speaking English for the first time or whatever. But um, what the, the, we went there as uh, volunteers to help introduce them to the, to the wonders of photography. What the teacher who we were working with said was, um, you know, you need to be aware that having strangers come into their classroom can be a scary thing for them. And in fact, um, it, 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 we made it work. It was great. One of the things uh, we did was we went around uh, the, the neighborhood and let them do photos of their own choosing uh, as they went around the neighborhood. And so we gave them agency. One, one of the students, his, we asked them then to, to pick their favorite photo. And this was the favorite photo of one of the students. We we're going to do a gallery. I mean, a public gallery. And I was told this is going to be scary for the students, but they all did it. They all picked their favorite picture. They all wrote about their favorite picture. And then we had a public gallery for this. This particular student wrote about this picture. And we, it, we were walking down the street. I still remember walking down the street and there was this old beat up pickup truck. And most of the kids were laughing and it was just kind of a silly moment because it, it was full of stuff, you know, it was just, but he took this picture. Now, this, this is a student who, uh, he just come to the US. He's, uh, he didn't speak English yet. I think he was two or three months in here. This was the picture that he chose. And what he chose to write about it, once we translated, translated his Spanish, it was, uh, it blew my mind because, he called it the boots of gold. And I'll just read this. He says, I took this picture because it's the truck of someone that works hard to survive. The working man's tools are more valuable than gold because it's how he feeds his family. And that's what he saw when we passed the truck. And so, you know, these experiences that we give students can be really powerful. Um, PBL can level the playing field, of course, you know, the different active learning and everyone gets involved. Um, Project-based learning is interdisciplinary, which is important because, you know, all of the really important problems facing society today require interdisciplinary solutions. People coming together to solve climate change, hunger, world peace, all of this stuff requires math, science, engineering, language arts, social sciences, political science, all this. And then 
project-based learning really can be transformational, especially if you use that rubric and kind of ask yourself, how do we make this really an extraordinary experience for our students? And then it'll become memorable and really can change some lives actually. So anyway, that's um, what I wanted to share today. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy, happy to give a stab at answering them. Jim, thank you so much for being here and for sharing today. I mean, such great insights from you, but also such great insights from the students that you were working with as well. And um, I think it's always really important to remember to take that kind of pause and listen to our students because the things that they have to tell us kind of always blow my mind a little bit. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, the first one here is, can you think of any tech tools that could help teachers implement things like project-based learning in their classrooms? <laughs> There's a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, but let me say first, though, that um, the, the tech is not what will make it transformational by itself. You don't, you can do it, it can be as, it could be as inexpensive as duct tape and chewing gum, you know. Um, and you know our egg drop was was fairly low tech. On the other hand, with the egg drop, for example, I wish I had done uh, a reflection activity with video. So a lot, you know, these are second graders. Some of them could write, some of them were learning to write with inventive spelling, and some of them were having a challenge expressing themselves in writing. But if I had let them create a TikTok-like video mm. to tell us about their design and their design process and whatnot. It would have been great because then they could all be reflecting on what they did. They could show us what they did. And, and I think it would have been a more uh, fluid way of expressing themselves at that grade level. And it's easy to do. There's all sorts of tools for doing uh, videos in the classroom. Not, don't use TikTok. I mean, <laughs> but, <there's, laughs> but, but I mean, uh, there, are also, there are ways to do video snippets mm -hmm. to capture a student's thinking. Yeah, that's great. Seesaw, yeah, someone yeah, just mentioned so, Seesaw here. Exactly, yeah. yeah, stuff like that. And love that. I mean, we're going to be talking more about universal design for learning kind of all day today, but I, you know, this is such a great point in that same vein in that you can give students different ways to complete the same assignment, saying something like, we're going to have a reflection activity. If you'd rather provide a video, if you'd rather write, if you, you know, giving students options to complete the same um task in a lot of different ways and um, project-based learning seems like such um, a great way to kind of implement more of that in a classroom. It really opens the door for a lot of interesting thinking and I was surprised by what the students could do. I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm sure everyone here would be surprised too. You know we, we expect students to do x y or z and they're going to do z z squared you know right. <laughs> because, it's, because especially if it's their own project. If you give them the agency to do something that's their own. Well, you can't stop them. Yeah, that's great. Um, I have a couple more questions for you here. Um, a question, you mentioned these engineering kits that you provided to your team for you know different projects. Someone asked if you could just share some examples of things that you included in those kits. Well, back in the day when we were doing the 10 minute engineering exercises, um, it was simple stuff, inexpensive, simple stuff like, um, <laughs> you know, oh, handful of spaghetti noodles, really, uh, you know, two yards of scotch tape, um, some five sheets of paper, uh, you know, construction paper, and maybe that was it. Uh, it could be, and you can get it, it can be as elaborate or not as elaborate as you'd like, um, and whatever your budget will allow. You know, there are fancy techie kits, too, you can do, sure. uh, where you're actually building robotics and things, but um, like I said, you can start simple and move your way up to complicated uh, if your budget allows. I love that. Um, kind of a, a more specific question here. So um, this question is talking about at the college or university level. So are there ways to use this project-based learning at the college level outside of a direct science or engineering classes? Do you have any thoughts or advice for something like a college level English class? College level English class. Oh, well, here's where I'd go with that. But before I talk about English, let me just mention that 
engineering projects outside of class have existed for many years, a couple of decades actually. Um, Purdue, for example, had a has a program where the engineers were, would work with organizations in the community to solve real problems. So find a nonprofit or find a, you know, so they'd go out and design, I don't know, uh, uh, wheelchair accessories for, uh, you know, uh, or would they go out and design uh, any number of things. They So I guess make it real, find an organization that has a real problem and let, and let students have at it and see what they do. Now, you mentioned, uh, in English, yeah, the or level English class. Or something, yeah, something outside of the STEM realm. Well, here's where here's where I would go with it is uh, is with micro documentaries, and it, go out and uh, write a create a story, a story that lasts two minutes by interviewing somebody interesting that you, you whose story is worth telling. 